So we've reached the final session of this conference. This is a session that talks about the deepest points in Israeli strategy and its general contact. And, but it's not, not that it is less important than the other strategic issues that we talked about today. In many ways, this aspect, as we've seen over the past year, this aspect may be even be more important. The past year, since last May, in many ways was a has been a year of turmoil, probably one of the most dramatic years in the history of Arab society in Israel and in Jewish Arab relations in Israel. Incidents that began in May, the most the most severe clashes between Arabs and Jews. And this was part of the deepest intervention and in, involve, in, involvement of, Arab, of Israeli Arabs in Israeli politics. And the leader of, these, of this effort is Dr. Mansour Abbas, chair of the Ra'am party. And Dr. Mansour, I think that we'll begin with a question that looks back at the past year from your perspective. You, in, you started with an initiative that was groundbreaking, and how would you summarize it? If we start to compare where we were last year at the, on the verge of civil war, I think the clash, uh, the clash at the time was not between the Arabs, the Arabs and the and the police. It was between civilians, which is what was different between which is why it was different from the events of October 2000. And if we start from that point, the st if we look at the starting point, then we certainly are in a positive balance and we're going in the right way, in the right direction, despite all the challenges and all the attempts and the suspicion of people about whether it will succeed or not. We managed to overcome all of the obstacles so far, and the challenge that we began with, which still exists, is to give the, allow this process to continue and to maintain the coalition, maintain the government, even with a significant, if with a definite majority of 61 or 60 votes, uh, people say that the coalition has weakened, in my opinion, after following the developments and being part of the political developments over the past year, it, the challenge is basically the same. So I am so the so when so the fact that Edith that Edith Selman left the coalition doesn't bother me because I think that if we continue working in the right way, time is working in our favor. In, the ge in general, and from the perspective of Arab society, there is no doubt that it was able to break new ground. At least the Jewish population, the Arab population now has several options. It's that generally dogmatic. What was is what will be. And despite the fact that there are parties from different ends of the, the spectrum, there is a party with a more Islamic tendencies and more communist tendencies, but overall, the goals are sh are shared. The goals were always shared, but now at least you uh, the goals were always the same. But now you have another alternative. If you also want to say that there there are others, there are those that don't even participate in the elections. They're not part of the political game, or they are involved in a negative way. And then there are those who are involved. They participate, but to only to a certain extent. They want change, but they don't want to understand that this change is the result of a process of partnership. Our party came, the United Arab Party said that it would work with cooperation as part of, as a partnership, not a partnership as a result of the change. How will the change be made without a partnership? So on the political level and from the perspective of the status of Arab society, we're going in the right direction. And also, if we want to talk about economic and social issues, education and arrangements in the Negev, etc., what we say is that the five—we're talking about a five, about 27 five-year plan 
that include agriculture and even sports, if we want to talk, then it's very important to emphasize these issues. And even though we're still talking about reducing gaps, if we manage to implement these plans and move forward, then we will be able to start talking about closing gaps. It's also very important not to forget the very painful issue of violence and crime within Arab society that is being projected into all of Israeli society. This has been the first year, 2022, this is the first year in which the curve that was always rising, the graph of violence and crime was always ri has always been rising, and now we see we start we're suddenly seeing a decrease, 30 percent decrease in murder cases and shootings. And another aspect is that in Arab society, the di the discourse is about taking responsibility for ourselves. The police will do its job, and the government plays an important role as well. But the other side that talks about taking responsibility for ourselves and doing what has to be done, if there's violence and crime in Arab society, it is, co it is often culture-based. Based. We object to the f to the argument that is part of our that this is part of our culture, but. Some people consider family honor a part of the um, killings as part of our culture, but a society has to the society has to develop a new set of values that will address these issues. But this and this summary reflects the fact that we're going in the right direction. So despite the difficulties and the challenges and everything else that is happening that have influenced us, especially things that have happened in the last month, we managed to overcome these difficulties because we see the process going in the right direction. And Dr. Mansour, do you think that Arab society as a whole sees things in this way as well? Do you, all, do you think that they're also seeing the achievements? Because we have heard criticism saying that this attempt isn't really working and we don't really see the fruit of these efforts. That the Arab society is like Jewish society and Israeli society in general. There are disagreements, there are different factions, different, fa different sectors, each ideological uh, denomination has different ideology. There's the Northern Islam, there's the Southern Islam, the there's the nationalists and the communists, etc. So there certainly are disagreements within Arab population, and there are political parties that that pursue the cooperation between. They always explained that the goals would be obtained through Jewish Arab partnership. And how is that actually? How do they describe? How do they perceive that as being carried out? It is stopped at a. It reaches a very very limited type of cooperation with is within Israeli society. And our party talks about all of the Israeli Jewish population from end to end as a single unit. I accept that. And I I'm not trying to change anyone. I am changing myself. I'm making changes within my set within my own sector. There, we have support within Arab within the Arab sector. You know that all of the polls show about 60, 65 percent support for the process itself. And of course, we won't compare the power of the United Arab Party as a party that still comes from a very specific sector within the Arab sector the Islamic movement, and you still have a hard time reaching the other ethnic groups, like the Druze. And then there's the, the, this is the Islamic group that don't always agree with everything that we say. So our role is also, to, in order to close the gap between support for our party as a group, as a party that is leading a process, and the support that we receive in general from Arab society, we have to adopt ourselves as a party to become more open and more containing of other ability, with a greater ability to contain other groups, but still linked to the Islamic movement. That's our home. That's where we come from.
There were a few, uh, we discussed this several times, and people have said to me that it would have been wonderful if the United Arab Party wasn't affiliated with the Islamic movement. In that case, we would lose 70% of the meaning of the significance of the process that we're carrying out. The fact that a party that was established at the initiative of the Islamic movement with all of its ideological and, uh, con and religious context it is possible that there is no other party that could have done the, gone through the process that we did. And therefore, it's very important for the United Arab Party to remain can affiliated with the Islamic movement. I'm one of the leaders of the, mov of the, mov of the mov movement. And I know that the religious, aspect, the religious perspective is containing its tolerance and its dyna dynamic. It can change and it can contain New ideas, and we've already proven that. You had an interview on the Saudi Ilaf website, and it said, we're not the Muslim Brotherhood. What does that mean? They also published two days ago. These days, we are also marking five years to the passing of Sheikh Abdullah Nima Dawish, who is the founder of the Islamic movement. And I did not know this interview, and then he was also asked the same question maybe 20 odd years ago, and he gave the same qu answer, we're not the Muslim Brotherhood, because if you take any ideological faction, Islamic, liberal, communist, any party that is associated with this faction will, or this denomination, will have similar um, aspects with other countries around the world. However, it doesn't mean that you're the same. If you have this title of an Islamic movement, a party, then of course Islam dictates many aspects. But uh, Nimo Dawish had said that it was going to be a local movement, defined it as a movement that not only tries to, but actually balances between the various identities, and not no only the civil identity as citizens of the state of Israel with the national identity, but within Within Arab society, we also have another identity, whether you're religious, national, local, Bedouin, Falakh, northern, southern, etc. Sheikh Abdullah Nimr Darwish had the ability to understand that he must pave a way where various identities can live together, can coexist. And I am, I, and I am continuing with this approach because I come from a place where you can see all the colors. My village is a Druze one. I am a Muslim minority in a Druze village, which is a minority in Arab society, which is a minority in Israeli society, which is a minority in the Middle East. And I am member of a family that is quite small and there are larger tribes, larger uh, families and that means that allocation of resources is, is impacted from where you live, with the region you live in, and the state of Israel and that means that many problems that you sometimes describe in the Israeli Jewish context or Arab Jewish context, I see in a completely different way. I see it more from a value perspective. If there is a crisis, if there is racism, then the color of it is not Jewish or Arab. Its color can change based on this mosaic. And you, there's no distinction between good and bad, good people and bad people. This community has a certain hegemony, has a certain allocation of resources, but when you go to another community, the minority in that community becomes a majority in another community, and then they use most of the resources, and that is in the religious context, in the family context, etc. And therefore, it is easier for me to cope with this complexity, both because of the background of what I learned from Sheikh Abdullah Nimr Darwish, but also because of my own personal history, which demonstrates the approach that we're talking about. And you know, 
Dr. Mansour, we talked until now about both the breakthroughs and the achievements, but in order to really be sincere and honest, it's important to also talk about baggage, let's say, between Jewish and Arab society. And the May events is kind of an open story. It's an event that not only uh, has not healed, it's still a wound very much. And I'm interested in knowing two things. First of all, there's a whole world of interpretation, very diverse, especially in the Israeli media, as to what led to the, the May events. Is it... Um, um, anti-Semitism and racism, or is it a matter of uh, feeling um, um, discriminated against? Um, so is it incitement or is it discrimination? Well, it's more complex than that. And that's why comparisons help us. Why did these events only take place in one city, in one town, and not in another, or less so elsewhere? But without a doubt, the main characteristic of these very bad or very uh, uh, difficult events is the involvement of the mixed cities. And therefore, we need to see all the different factors. And if I want to go into it, and before I move on to answering the second question, the same situation I was in when we started talking about crime and violence. Two theories were dominant until recently when it came to this um, area. The first is the conspiracy theory in among Arab public. That it is Israel that wants to crush Arab society. Had they wanted to, they would have ended with this phenomenon within 24 hours. That's what people think. And important leaders in Arab society would talk about that, that it is a Zionist conspiracy, the state of Israel wants not, uh, not only neglect Arab society, but it's a conspiracy, it's a plot against it. That's the one theory. The second theory was it is, it's Arab culture. And once we started to investigate it, to study it, and, and research it, in the last, and the previous uh, government has set up a committee and suddenly the findings and the data emerge. And of course, it's a complex Im image. And it's not just two reasons, it's maybe eight or nine reasons. And instead of each holding the other accountable, the Director General of Netanyahu's Prime Minister's office, we said, they said the Israeli government has failed. It's our responsibility. And then suddenly I felt more accountable to come and say we also failed. And it's true, it was a mutual failure. So this image of one phenomenon, crime and violence, reflects other things. If we start to analyze it, we'll be surprised to discover that there are other issues and other factors that have also led to this escalation. And therefore, we don't only want to remain in this um, kind of um, this kind of examination stage, and now we, said we have, for the first time, promoted programs specifically for mixed cities. Arab populations in the mixed cities were not part of the government, were not part of Arab society, were not part of the local leadership. We all know about 922, the economic uh, plan uh, proposed by Netanyahu five or six years ago, the heads of the local Arab authorities refused to take part and to have their public in mixed cities participate in these programs and get the resources. Why? For what reasons? For practical reasons? No. For their interest. It's their interest. It's our money and they'll go. it will go to our local authorities. And not only that, there are 33 Arab communities that are with in the local authorities that are mixed with Jews, mixed, Jew, mixed uh, local authorities, 33 communities, and they too were not um, part in, uh, in the allocation of resources of, of, of uh, Plan 922. And when we did Plan 5050, we are a party and we are called the United Arab List, so we are supposed to represent everyone, not only 
We now, of course, are happy with the use of the term Arab society, which has different sectors, but it's also in the government's official papers. So we said, first and foremost, we need to take care of the Druze as well, and the, uh, the uh, Circassian. And they got 40% of the allocated resources and also lift cities and the program will be approved in a couple of weeks' time and also the communities that are in the local authorities that are regional and so on. And so each of them has a part in this program and that's the direction in which we're headed. However, it's not enough to just have a comprehensive government plan. Now we are also going to put into practice the civil initiatives and to also support local initiatives that emphasize, I mean, the first call for proposal that came out from the Ministry of the Galilee and Negev is one that focuses on plans and programs for improving the fabric of Israeli society, Jewish and Arab. There's a lot to be done on various levels. On the religious level, of course, there's another initiative that is being developed there. And so if we say that there are many factors and many reasons, then we also need to align programs accordingly, because that's your question. Can it come back? And perhaps even more. And also, yes, if we neglect things, then yes, it can come back. It can happen again. We can uh, we don't only have to make progress and go forward. We can maybe go, so go backwards as well. And that's something that I would like to reiterate. Last year, we negotiated with both blocs. And then the events in May happened, and uh, guardian of the walls and so on, and then they decided to stop the negotiations. But it continued. It continued because everyone understood that there's no other option. We have to move forward. And therefore, just two or three weeks after these May events, we set up these coalition, this coalition. So even though these events were harsh, and as you've described it, it was the harshest, most difficult event since the establishment of the State of Israel. However, we moved forward, and we managed to take this step the first historical step and set up a government or a partnership the way it is now. You know, we are about to conclude and I want not only to look at the political developments that are ongoing, that are daily, we are surrounded by them, we also want to look down the line, five, ten years. How do you, Dr. Mansour, see this story of the Jews and Arabs? Because we notice there are so many fundamental problems and issues. So what you started this past year, is that something that is the final stop? Or is it some, are there other things that you still want to promote in terms of changing the space? Look, I've noticed that anyone who has engaged in this area of the relations between Jews and Arabs and the partnership between them has always addressed it as an instrument. In Arab society, Hadash, how do we achieve our goals within the state of Israel? By having a Jewish-Arab partnership. And also, the other plans, the other programs, the other approaches that have come from this direction of the state, the government, they too were, we want the Arab-Jewish partnership, the Arab-Jewish relations in order to have to be feel more comfortable living together and to create recognition so that each will accept the other without having conflict, without a disagreement, without all these terrible issues in this relationship. And then I thought to myself, maybe we should change our approach. Maybe we should start looking at this um, partnership as an objective, as an end rather than a means to an end. And then when you see this relationship as the end rather than the means, then you say, okay, what should we do in order to reach this ideal? And what is the ideal? And there, of course, you can all, each person sees their own vision. But beyond the issues of the everyday, of the day-to-day, -day, but to, to live together with respect, with, with, with in safety, and that is valid for 
the relationship in Israel between citizens, Jews and Arabs, between Jews and Jews and between Arabs and Arabs. But if we accomplish using this civil model that is based on values such as tolerance, such as sharing, such as mutual responsibility, such as humane values, then we can also manage with the greater and more complex issue which we discussed now of the relations between Palestinians and Israelis and where we are headed in that respect as well. And therefore, that's actually the second question. What is our role as, Arab, as the Arab society that on the one hand has an identity that it is part of this nation, it is part of this Palestinian people, but it's also part of Israeli society and being Israeli citizens? How can we... How should we conduct ourselves? How can we make a contribution? Because ultimately, we are paying the price. Last year, without a doubt, the worst effect was within Arab society. This year, we have managed to cope better and the events didn't, I mean, they were terrible events but they did not go beyond a certain point. And you cannot remain in this situation where you will always remain under this threat, whereby whatever you have managed to build here can get ruined quickly in light of events that you have no control over. But that to me, and I said that you know very clearly, we went to the Arab public and we said we are going to put at the head of our priorities the issues of the Arab society. And I think that is the right way to go about it. And I think it's moral. Some people accuse me saying that you have neglected the Palestinian issue and you have neglected the Palestinian identity and so on. I think that to deliver on my promises and what I have promised the Arab electorate and my voters is first of all a moral commitment and I believe that our success here in Israel with this civilian, humanitarian, humane approach where you are politically tolerant will also help on the other level. And then through the citizen, or the civilian aspect, I can serve, not serve one side, serve the entire uh, community in the Holy Land, as I like to call it. Just a quick question uh, based on what you've said very briefly, Dr. Mansour, based on what you've just said, looking ahead, according to polls and surveys, it seems that the majority in uh, the Arab society says that they shouldn't just be in the coalition but also in the government. Would you be willing to consider that? Look, when we decided to go for this formula and to be part of the coalition but not in the government, we considered two things. There is no principle or position where, like the ultra-Orthodox, they don't want to be part of the government, which has changed recently. Uh, like I see, it's not as if we're saying we don't want to be part of the government, but we did take into account two things. First of all, Arab society and you uh, follow what's happening there. There is a rift. There is a great uh, argument, and it uh, leads to incitement and use of violence. There is verbal violence, of course, but there's also physical violence. And you were a victim of that. Yes, I was. That's on the one hand. And so you took a step that does not tear apart these ties. It does not sever ties between society. But also, if you look back two years ago, we recommended Benny Gantz and Blue and White twice, and we didn't manage it. And one of the insights I had was that Israeli Jewish society is not yet prepared, is not yet ready for it. And so when Ram uh, went ahead with this move, we changed 
our view, our position on the political spectrum. We said we're not left-wing, we're not right-wing, we're willing to work with everyone, we're willing to go with anyone who comes, and we uh, are reaching out for anyone. We don't want to uh, go against anyone, only those who are against us. And I thought that it would be right to also allow Jewish society to have the time it needs, that it can all, all also adjust. It's not easy to finish with the May riots and then sit together uh, around the government table and just listen to the discourse that Netanyahu is and the Likud are back with, that we are compromising Israel's security and the government cannot function because Ram is there and they cannot decide on security issues. That's why we thought this was the right thing to do. But in the future, perhaps we will decide that we will say, okay, we do want to move on and take this step. Okay, I'm getting all these signs from every from the audience saying that we're done for now. Dr. Mansour, I personally asked about tenths of the questions I was going to ask you. Uh, I'm giving long answers. Uh, sometimes I make uh, answers that then get me into trouble, but I never give brief answers. Okay, I certainly hope that just as with the Palestinian issue that was discussed before, we're not going to leave it up in the air. So with the relations between Jews and Arabs, we'll delve deep, we'll get to know each other, we'll make decisions together. And I just want to thank you so much for this wonderful conversation. Thank you, thank you all very much. Thank you, Mansoor.